Llanciach Fawr Manor House. Here in the uplands of Glamorgan is a very rare surviving example of a 16th century Welsh capital house. There were several in this area, uh, but over the years, those that weren't demolished have either been turned into boutique hotels, multiple dwelling occupancies, gastro pubs, and because of that, many of them have either lost their original features entirely or they've been covered up, plastered over, blocked in. So Llankayach is almost unique in this area, retaining as it does many of its original features. Now, the reason for this is entirely due to the Pritchard family. It was the Pritchards who had Llankayach Fawr built. In around 1550, David Ap Richard, who came from Murtha, decided to make this area the seat of his family. And this was the result of his labours. Uh, over the next 115 years, it passed from son to son, eventually coming into the hands of Colonel Edward Pritchard. Now, it's his household that we recreate every day as a living history museum. Uh, but Colonel Pritchard died in 1655, and he left only two daughters. The land and the house, the 6,000 acres of it, was split between the two. And when they came of age and married, as was the law in those days, their property became their husband's property. Indeed, the wives themselves were considered property of their husbands. Over the years, part of it was sold off. Uh, other pieces were given in dowry for you know, female members of the family until... Eventually, there was only 600 acres left. Uh, after the 1670s, the house had become no more than a tenanted farm. And so that continued in 1731, when the Evans family took over the lease of Sankayach Vaur. Now, they farmed it successfully for 200 years, until 1931, when it was purchased by Mr. Edward Williams. Uh, Edward farmed the land again, was a very successful farmer, raised his family here. Unfortunately, in 1970, Mr. Williams passed away. His wife, Enid, she continued to live here until 1979, when it was decided that the house, the lands, they were too much for her, so they were sold to as it was then, Rumley Valley District Council. They held on to it for a few years, wondering what to do with it, and then, in 1991, decided to open a living history museum, something that was almost unique in Britain at the time. Now, I've said that the house was built in 1550. However, there is evidence to suggest that the house itself, or at least parts of it, are much, much older. The reason we have a date of 1550 for Llankayach is due to the work of dendrochronologists. Now, dendrochronology is often used to date old buildings, and the work involves taking a core sample from wooden beams. Now, as we all know, trees, when they grow, uh, every, every year they will leave an extra ring, and those rings can be counted to date a tree. Well, those rings remain when the trees are cut down and they worked to make beams and doorways of old houses. If a core sample is taken, it can be compared next to a database of tree rings of a known age, and accurate dates can be determined for a property. Sometimes they're even so accurate that they can determine the very month that a tree was cut down. Now, back in 2011, Sankayach was featured in an episode of Time Team, and one of the cameos on the show was that they took a sample uh, of a beam from up in the attics and that gave us a date of somewhere between 1548 and 1560. 1550 seemed a good date to settle on. The problem is that there are references to a manor house here before 1550. During the late 1530s, a gentleman by the name of John Leland undertook uh, a great tour 
of Britain. He travelled from north to south, from west to east. And on his journeys, which lasted several years, he took extensive notes um, detailing the people he met, the crops that were grown, rivers, bridges, manor houses, prominent families, all sorts of interesting details. And in 1542, he came and visited Gessley Gay. Now, we know for a fact that he came in 1542, several years before this house is supposed to have been built, and yet he wrote in his notes, there is within half a mile of Carfiri, by est a fair place called Van, where Mr. Edward Lewis dwelleth. Other gentlemen of any fame be not in all St. Hennet, saving David Ap Richard, dwelling at Keltley Care in Hokayak, and Matthew Ap Rice Behan in Keltley Care Parok also. Hachkayak appears to be a grim attempt of a Lancashire-born Londoner to phonetically set to paper the word Ichkayak, meaning Upper Kayak. Uh, he also mentions Iskayak, meaning Lower Kayak, and both these terms are still in use today. Uh, they've changed slightly. We have Slankayak Ichav, meaning the Upper, and known locally Slankayak Isha, Lower Slankayak. But there are structural parts of the house that also give clues to what might be a far earlier date of construction. And for that, we have to go inside the manor house. Now, in order to gain a relatively accurate date of an old property, it's a good idea to look at several key things. Dendrochronology, as we already mentioned, can very accurately date the beams of a house. But that's not to say that those beams are original. There are parts of Llankayach Fawr that don't quite fit to the 1550s, but there are certain aspects of this house that reflect far earlier fortified houses uh, from the 14th to the 16th century. Um, houses sometimes referred to as peel towers or, or basil houses uh, were built, primarily in the north of England, Scotland, but there were several around the southwest part of Wales, around Haverford West. And the construction of these houses was to have a vaulted cellar below the house, then a space above that, more rooms or an attic above that, and sometimes even further rooms above. The mark of those houses being that the floor space, the square footage of the floor space was identical on every level of the house. Now, Llankayach has a lovely large kitchen at this end, a smaller kitchen through to the middle of the house, a large great hall, a reasonable sized parlour, and bedrooms of different sizes. But if we look to the rear of the house, to the northeast quarter, that's where clues start to emerge that might suggest the house is far, far earlier. We'll look first in the cellars. Now here we are in the cellar at Llankai Achbawr, a part of the house that very few people get to see. It was a little larger at one time. These walls here were put in relatively recently, uh, but it does have a lot of the features of a medieval cellar. It has this wonderful vaulted ceiling. The walls down here in parts are round and about six feet thick, which would suggest a house built with fortification in mind. We can gain another clue from the room that's directly above us. Now we've come to the room directly above the cellars. I'm standing almost directly above the position I was when we were down there. But it's the dimensions of this room that are interesting. It's almost a perfect square. Now, Sankayach Bauer has many, many rooms, uh, but the vast majority of them are either rectangular or even quite uneven in shape. And it's this regularity of form that suggests perhaps this part of the house is considerably older. It's starting to look very much like the Basel or Peel house that was common from the 14th to the 16th century. Now, 
we can see the dimensions of this room. We'll compare them to the dimensions of the room directly above us. Now, before we go in to the next room, there's something here in this modern stairwell that is of great interest. And it does certainly lend some credence to the suggestion that this part of the house is considerably older than the rest of it. Now, this modern stairway was built in 2014. Um, it was built as part of the uh, refurbishments and repairs that were undertaken when we had a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant. It also gave us the opportunity to make a closer study of this window. Now, as you can imagine, this was, until 2014, an exterior window. But the interesting thing about it is that this mullion is far earlier than 16th century. In fact, it's more likely to be late 14th or early 15th century. Now, not unusual in itself if you were building a grand house, as I said, below stairs. You would have, uh, if you had access to, to pre-cut beams, perhaps from an earlier house that was derelict, you'd use them. The same would go for dressed stone. Employing masons was an expensive business. So, if you could reuse and recycle from an earlier property, that's exactly what you did. The fact that this, though, is set into the part of the house we think might be earlier, well, I think it lends a good deal of weight to the case for this part of the house being 14th or 15th century. So, to the room directly above the still room. And most notably, it is of precisely the same size as that room. The same can be said for the room directly above, which is now set out as a bedroom. For the fact that there is a cellar two stories below us, then there's a still room, there's this room, there's the bed chamber above us, and the attic above that, all of exactly the same size, I think does suggest that this was perhaps a peel house or a basil house long before the rest of the house was built onto it. Now, one of the main features of these peel or basil or tower houses was that they almost always had a privy tower. And this house is no exception. It has been altered over the years, but if you look from outside the house, the privy tower is exactly in the right position so that it could service this house if it stood alone as a tower house. Another clue that shows how important the lower privy was to the northeastern quadrant of the house can be seen here. Now this is from the parlour and we can see now that there's direct access to the privy from the parlour, which is almost certainly a later part of the house. However, we know that the privy was accessible from here in the antechamber, the room that is directly above the still room below. Though there is now a panelled wall there, we knew for many years that there was direct access to the privy behind that panelling. And during the renovations in 2014, we were able to make a close examination of the original doorway. That shows us that this part of the house could easily have existed on its own and still maintained direct access to the important privy tower. Now here to the rear of the house, we can see this modern stairwell. It does look very period accurate. In fact, one of the historians who came to visit the house after the work was finished did think that this was part of the original construction. But one unfortunate thing about the new tower is that it does now obscure the original privy. It can still be seen and we'll take a look at it, but it runs from the very top right down to the floor and into the old drains. Now, before this was built, small excavation was undertaken here and we uncovered the original drains, which did look particularly medieval. But if we take a look at the tower, there we can see the privy tower set directly next to it, exactly where it would need to be if this was originally constructed as a peel or tower house. If we look at the coin work on the corner of the northeastern towers, it's made of these large, hefty blocks. This would have provided great strength and stability. 
Yet, if we look to the corners of what is more likely the later construction, there is no such heavy-duty coin work. It's the same stone that's used in the rest of the walls. In fact, the only part of what is most likely the later construction where you'll find heavy coins set into wall corners are here, to the northern rear of the small kitchen. Even here, it's obviously reused stone. This large block here, used as a piece of coin work, was obviously once a window mullion that's been borrowed or perhaps even robbed out of a much earlier building that probably stood somewhere nearby. And so then to this uppermost room, directly above the two rooms you've already seen, directly above the cells below, and again of equal dimensions. It certainly suggests that this northeastern quarter of the house was built as a single unit and then over time other parts of the house were tacked onto it. There's direct access here to the privy and if we look out from the hallway this short passageway looks almost like something of, a, of an afterthought. It's not particularly well thought out and also look at the thickness of these walls. That seems quite ludicrous for an internal wall. However, if you consider this as the outer wall with a very thick retaining wall here, good for defence, you'd be safe on the inside of your tower house. If there's danger outside, it's highly unlikely that they will be able to get through. So now we find ourselves in the northern attic, the uppermost section of the quadrant of the house that we've been studying. And it was during the, the large renovations in 2014 that an opportunity presented itself to make a very particular and unique study of the house. Um, we were able to look at it in a way that probably hadn't been possible since the house was first constructed. You see, part of the money that we were given by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we decided to put aside and use to construct a new roof. Now the beams, these all seem to be in pretty good order, but the tiles that had been put on in the 1980s, they hadn't fared as well. So it was decided to remove those and replace them with good quality slate. So with this in mind, the company who were employed to undertake the work, they knew it would take several months. So rather than simply work when the weather was good, they decided to build a scaffold around the whole house and place a huge artificial roof on it. This meant that they could continue working even when the weather was bad, but it also gave us a unique opportunity. Because climbing onto that scaffold meant that we could look down into the structure of the house. All these beams were visible, but we could also see the tops of the walls. And this northern quadrant was the only part that was completely tied in and intact. We could see other later areas of construction, but they just been butted up against this perfectly square tower house. So having now looked inside the northeastern quarter of this house, we've taken a look at that vaulted cellar below, the rooms directly above it, one atop the other, each one of equal dimensions. It allows us to come outside the house and look upon it with fresh eyes and see it in something of a different light. Because looking at it now, it seems perfectly feasible that this northeastern part of the house could very well have stood alone. Only later would the rest of the house be built onto and around it, giving it a completely different aspect. So, is Llankaiach Fawr 471 years old? Parts of it certainly are. Parts of it are a little later. We know for a fact that the Grand Stay was built in 1620, probably the same time as the porch. Uh, but looking at that northeastern quarter with its rooms of equal dimensions, with its access to the privy chamber, with what appear to be oddly cut doorways in from this part of the house, it does suggest that that is a far earlier construction. We know about John Leland when he came here in 1542, and also another writer, Rice Ap Merrick, 
who traveled through this area in 1578 and published a book containing descriptions of Carfili and Gechlige, and he makes mention of a fine house. Unfortunately, he doesn't give a description of it. Much about Llancaech Fawr is a mystery, and it's just one more of those mysteries to add to that ever-increasing bundle. Perhaps when things are looking a little brighter, you could come along and have a look for yourself. Until next time, Hoyle Bauer.